So let's kick off season two. Um, this season's title is going to be a new front line for freedom. So we're bringing in uh, technologists across critical infrastructure sectors who are, you know, in the battle every day with our advanced nation state adversaries. Our first guest, Jay, the CIO at Helmer and Payne, good friend of mine. Yeah, we've known each other now for what, four or five months. Um, but yeah, we have the the, the shared um, passion for martial arts uh, that helped kick it off. But Jay, you want to tell the audience here a little bit about yourself and uh, and how you came to be sitting here in this room with us? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, the the introduction to you guys happened a few months back, as you say. We were at a, at a Microsoft uh, event, and uh, a lot of a lot of folks from Oklahoma were there, and uh, we were talking about uh, all things technology, but but cyber. Uh, you guys were there to kind of talk about your your mission around cyber. Um, I was was actually it was your story. You stood up, kind of talked about your background, um, your military background, and kind of what what evolved to conquest cyber. And and I love that the that the mission really is just to protect. Uh, you know, protect the, the U.S. and companies and all the gaps that exist. Um, I think it's um, I think it's it's obviously a growing growing challenge. And uh, to me, it was just the culture. You know, as I met people at, at Conquest Cyber, you guys are very open to to feedback. You know, the, the challenge is going to continue to morph and change. And I think your business model is just just that. Right. Let's be flexible. Let's figure out what our pain points are for our customer and our nation and keep evolving. So I think that was fantastic. A little about me. Uh, born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I uh, have been working for Helmer Campaign for about 21 years. Uh, started as an engineer, my background is in mechanical engineering, and moved into the technology space about six years ago. And uh, the, at the time, uh, Helmer Campaign was undergoing kind of a transformation. We knew that digital is the way of the future, so taking our physical hardware and our drilling rigs and trying to morph that with some technology, we went through some acquisitions. Um, of technology companies, which arguably were startup kind of level companies. And so they're really, um, you know, a lot of opportunity to to secure them and make them better as we brought them into the enterprise. And as you say, being a critical infrastructure company, uh, just the growing threat there, um, it was, uh, it was uh, urgent. And so we continue along that path. And I think partnering with folks like Conquest Cyber uh, will make us, uh, will just make us better and, and help us secure us. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, the, uh, what I what I found fascinating about you know conversations we've had is um, this the CIO role we we run into organizations and that seems like the kind of the nexus between the technology organization and the business outcomes. Uh, you obviously you know have spent the last six years on this primarily on the technology side, but you know with those formative years you know being an operator in the business, do you think that's that's impacted the way that you attack the, the role that you're playing now in the organization? Absolutely. You know, I spent, uh, interestingly, Helmer and Payne, uh, when you start there as a young engineer, and we don't do this necessarily for all employees, but you start there, you really start your first uh, year, year and a half out there as a, as a roughneck. So I spent my first days on the drilling rig. I had finished up at TU with a master's degree studying coiled tubing fatigue, which is, I say that because it sounds fancy, right? It sounds very fancy. <laughs> but I moved over to to Roughneck and I was right. cleaning handrails, I was uh, pressure washing, I was mixing mud, and I was learning what's it like really to be out on the rig. And I think there's a multitude of things that were happening at that time. It's it's learning, you know, uh, how dangerous it can be. It's learning about how do you keep people safe? And when I go back to the office and worked as an engineer, how can I apply those things? And how can I think through a day in the life of a Roughneck? not just on the rig, but even after, right? You, 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 you realize that there's an, there's an empathy piece, right? You're away from your yeah. family. That affects your emotions. That affects your, your, your psychology of what you do on the rig floor. So how can we think about through that entire life cycle when someone's day is on? Okay. And it's, it's just a lot of work and the elements. <laughs> and I would say that coupled with that, um, and then moving in the technology space, it's been very much the same. I still try to get out to the rigs, understand now that we're changing the way we drill wells, and drill a hole in the ground. How is technology informing that? And I think there's no better way, uh, as you know, right? Physical and digital security kind of cross paths. So having to get out there and see, you know, what are the threats, right? Mm -hmm. They're not just someone attacking us at a computer, but there's the physical location, right. uh, there's the the telemetry, there's the the network, everything that could be impacted. So. I think it's important, right? And at the end of the day, we're business first, so no margin, no mission. So our right. job is to try to, to balance out speed of execution and providing outcomes with securing the company at the same time, right? If you go down, doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I, no margin, no mission. I've been, 
yeah, I've been I've been trying to explain um, frequently because we you know we talk about how we prioritize things. It's it's mission first, but it has to make business sense, or else we won't have the flexibility to to do things that are um, unconventional, unique, just in time. Um, and it's it's a much more eloquent and succinct way of putting it. No margin, no mission. Um, so. I'm going to borrow that. And, and I'll tell off. you, I borrowed that as well. We had, a, we had a, a, a gentleman that used to be one of our vice presidents of U.S. land who retired a few years ago, but he would make that comment all the time. It just simplified everything. So I yep. think, uh, you know, working in different parts of the business, but at the end of the day, if it's not creating that value, and, and, and the word margin, right, can mean a lot of things, but it has to create value for the customer yep. or for your company. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm going to change gears over here. Um, David and I were actually reading, and I talked to you a little bit about this last night the strategist. Um, so I was unaware that the Department of Defense did not accept cyberspace as a fifth domain until 2011. And NATO didn't accept it until 2016. So you know, we're kind of right on that the front cusp of figuring out how does this? How does this operate? How do we like what's coming next? We don't know it, right? The other domains are land, air, space, it's all in the natural world, whereas this is the first one that's in the human mind. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have boundaries. So how have you seen things change? You said you've been at Hunger Pain for 20 years? Yeah, 21 years. Yeah, so how have you seen since that was, change Since he was in, a, in diapers. Yeah. yeah. Since he was a little baby. <laughs> About the same height. <laughs> yeah. So how have you seen things change recently? You know, it's interesting. I, I, as you sent that that article over, and we yeah. we had that discussion, I, I did a little bit of digging, and I found some articles that, that kind of countered uh, countered that philosophy of you know the the, the four domains going to five, with yeah. cyber being being that fifth space. And Jeff, you know more probably than anyone, just coming from that background, right? When they talk about land, maritime, air, and space, and then they add in cyber. I, the article I read was, was read was kind of a, a taking an opposing view. Like, is that the right approach? Ooh, and I and I go back to your mission, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think about how companies sometimes work in silos. And I almost wonder. I kind of agreed with the article. It was taking the position that maybe that's a flawed idea, right? right? Because cyber really being um, kind of holistically across anything and everything. Um, so all those other four domains, I, I almost wonder if having it separated as a fifth is a mistake. And that's kind of what the article pointed out. Yeah. That it, I, I think there could be a tendency to silo it and then diminish, you know, yeah. how right. critical it is to those other domains. Yeah, it's it's. Oh, uh, that's interesting. It, yeah, it, the, you know, there's this concept in um, in ge of geographic combatant commands, right? Um, so there's North Northcom, uh, you know, Southcom, Africom, that type of thing, and then um, you know it evolved from the geographic which was really focused on the four domain or three domains, primary sea, air, land, which is where the seals got their name from, right? Um, and then the the first combatant command that ended up being kind of ubiquitous geographically, you know, um, uh, decentralized was special operations commands. And it was, you know, you need special operations in every geography, in every, you know, in every mission set, you're going to need to address the the special operations applications, uh, especially when you're in low intensity conflicts within those geographies. You, know, you don't want to roll in tanks when you can do it with just a couple of guys, right? Um, and I, I think that cyber is more aligned with that view that, you know, as we deploy satellites, you take out satellites, it's actually, you know, cyber that's likely the source of that. You're not going up there and, you know, shooting a satellite with an AR-15. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it is, I think, something that underpins all of it. And, and I think the objective should be to realize that all of them are a portion of conflict at all levels of conflict. And, I, and the recent happenings in, in Ukraine, I think, highlighted that um, it was it was cyber first, both as a deterrent in the U.S., like attacking Colonial Pipeline, showing, hey, we can get to your critical infrastructure, um, but also as like the activities leading up to conflict of taking out critical infrastructure and targeting it, you know, from by the Russians in, in Ukraine. And then you're also using it to deter other people from getting involved throughout Europe. So that application, you know, I think we started to, to see the connection that whether we want to call it a fifth domain of warfare or not, it it is now um, a portion of war that has to be considered all the time, whether whether it's peacetime, you know, 
you know, low intensity conflict or, you know, full blown, you know, nation state level, you know, war conflict. Yeah. So, so uh, whether we want to characterize it one way or the other, it's, it's there for us. Yeah. Right? And I think the intent, right, going back, I'm sure that the intent originally was like we need to to highlight the fact that cyber warfare is going on. So, I, right. you know, again, not knowing all the history, I'm sure that there, that was driving it and tying it back to your original question, how I've seen things change. I do think that the parallel I would draw, like in an enterprise, is that, you know, we can be siloed. And we went through as an organization a couple of years ago, kind of a team of teams approach. I think the book that, mm -hmm. that kind of calls that out is was written by, you know, a former military. Yeah, Stan McChrystal. Stan McChrystal. Yeah. And so... When you when you think about that, we've tried to evolve that way because we can be in a, in a, in a it, we can be in a silo, whether it's cyber or it's other business decisions, and and we are better when we collaborate, and and that's why I also like the approach that Conquest Cyber kind of calls out in its mission, and it's not just about um, it's not just about the government, it's also about private infrastructure and how those play together. Because right yeah. when we're being attacked, we're being attacked as a nation, and bad actors are going to use similar tools that nation states are going to use. So we're all in this together, and how we solve it. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's impossible for us to project power and protect our friends and allies overseas when we're not safe at home. And, you know, there's, you know, uh, different estimates, but let's call it 400,000 private organizations that are responsible for critical infrastructure in some way, shape or form. You know, if you take out um, a trucking company, you know, now people aren't getting the, the bare essentials that they need. Uh, if they're moving fuel and then attack an energy grid right now, the three day supply that you have in that hospital and the ICU on generator power, you know, isn't getting refilled. And so all of these different parts of our critical infrastructure are actually, you know, uh, an ecosystem. And it's, it doesn't take somebody to be that advanced to do something that's more coordinated against that ecosystem. Uh, so if we're thinking about it that way, the collective defense mindset is something that we all need because the government's not going to be able to protect it all really can't protect themselves right yeah. um so that's something that stuck out to me uh, as we were you know considering where we we're going to open up additional you know locations and i found that the community here in tulsa has that kind of intrinsic mindset of collaborating together and you're um yeah you know, you're stealing each other's employees right <laughs> the talent pool is, <laughs> yeah. is only so big um but you're also you know sharing you know experiences and wisdom and and trying to help the broader community here and that's something that uh, it just showed me that um there was cultural alignment between what we were trying to do in the community here that's it's rare you know um it, it happens kind of in um what what the east and west coast call flyover states but it, it's really where you know you guys have to band together um and and i think it's been exemplified here in the tulsa community more than anywhere else so being that you've you know, are critical to that. You play a major role in this community and the IT symposium that just happened and building capability. Um, how did you build that here? How did it, that come to be? I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I um, first off on the employees, I like to say sharing rather than stealing. Um, <laughs> Cause I do, I do think that feeds into the collaboration that you mentioned, right? As we share, as we share employees and knowledge and Tulsa is a small community as people jump around. I mean, ultimately I, I, I will tell my employees while I want them to to stay at home or campaign and continue to drive value, I think what's most important to me is that employees are, are feeling fulfilled and happy, right? right? If that's not at home or campaign, I do think that they should look to, to what's next, right? right. And, and there could be a lot of things impacting that. But, you know, I'll, I'll say that I stepped into a, a great community that's been built for, for, you know, from predecessors in the IT space, predecessors and CIOs that have existed before, even home or campaign's prior CIO was in that group. Mm -hmm very welcoming again i came from an engineering background so just being very very vulnerable I'll, I'll tell you when i first entered that room i thought man you know these guys have spent their you know spent their careers in it and i felt a little out of place but mm -hmm. i found very quickly that they were welcoming they were they were very warm um, very willing to share any knowledge and i had many individuals come up and say look if you have any questions do you have anything you want to talk about or share with our teams let's talk and yeah. i witnessed that yesterday i and you know, just kind of affirmed it i sat at a table with uh with uh, some 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 people from across town and that sat at the table with the CISO, very forthcoming with things they're doing to assess talent, how they're assessing talent. I mean, even on the topic of how we know that, that the IT space is really underemployed, he was still willing to share on how they're assessing, how they're recruiting, how they're drawing people in. And we're all right. fighting that battle together, again, ultimately to secure our companies. Yeah. Now it's, yeah, you can, you can read that from that room. Yeah. I, I, I spent a little bit of time just observing. It's what I, I spend most of my time doing. 
And you know, it's it's incredible to me what you've been able to do in uh, in an area that you know you most people across the country wouldn't think about how how much critical infrastructure is centered in places like Tulsa. Uh, if you know, if one of these organizations were compromised and we didn't all respond to it well, you know, things start to unravel. Um, so I, I, that connection, I think, I, I don't know how much that's talked about. Maybe you could share a little bit about how much you guys are thinking about the fact that it's not, you know, a script kitty or, you know, some some criminal gang just trying to, you know, get some ransom. But, you know, Russia and China and North Korea and Iran and, you know, that are that are coming after your businesses, you know, here. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny you bring that up and we were talking about how it's, you know, cyber in general is just a group effort, but it's something that I, I it's it's hard to compel, right, to whether it's users in the organization. And, and it's something I talk to uh, our CISO about often. And we even we had the we had the conversation this morning, but how do we compel that really is everyone's problem? And it is mm -hmm. real, right? It's yeah. not one of those situations where, well, it's not going to happen to me. You know, mm -hmm. people hear about what happened with Colonial and some of the other attacks. But just like uh, just like Colonial, right? The uh, the threat is real. We see that uh, we see that in our tools and our scanning and, and, and everything that we do. Um, what I would say is, I I, I think that and, and you know this is, as well as anybody, right? Again, bad actors are look they're opportunists, right? They're you know nation states have their their why, but mm -hmm. then again, other bad actors have their why. The tools are often the same, right? So and and just like we look for to automate whether it's security tools or other things in our environment, they're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I I think the the you'll know the statistic maybe better than I I would, but mm -hmm. right the the second you put put something online and, and make it internet facing, it gets how many times right yeah. in fifteen minutes it's just astronomical. Yeah, and I think those are the things we have to compel the people that the threat is real, whether it's in your personal life or whether it's in your your professional life, and we all have a a hand in in, in keeping the nation and our family safe. Absolutely. So you you sit at that kind of crux between you know the the technology that the business needs and the communicating that to you know the the C suites and um, you know board members. So wh what techniques have you used to try and uh, make it real and tangible for the leadership of the organization? Yeah, you know, um, at the at the executive leadership level, we we, we do share more about what the, the the threats are we're seeing. We try to connect those back to some of the personal things that have happened out there, whether it's Equifax, mm -hmm. whether it's Target. Try to connect it back to the how, and right. uh, and you know, people still tend to be. Uh, there was a speaker yesterday that talked about people, process, and technology. And while people are also, you know, your most valued and incredible asset, and can do great things for you. That's also the same thing that some of these bad actors are thinking, right? We are, we are all people. We are all flawed. We have the tendency to uh, to 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 wear a heart on a sleeve and be emotional at different things. Mm -hmm. And right, social engineering is such a big component. So, drawing that back to. Uh, you know, back to people. And as, as I kind of talk to the executive team and we talk about phishing scenarios and phishing sims, we kind of connect that back to the why. And, yeah. uh, and I think that that's, that's connecting with at least the upper management levels. And, mm -hmm. and we do target some of our specific groups in the company that may be more prime targets yeah, in terms so, of training. So it's, it's funny. We were, uh, yeah, we had the benefit of Jay um, coming to our, our, uh, our event last night and we were talking about hypnosis and people's susceptibility to that. Um, and you know, people who are, who are hypnotized, you know, they don't know they are, they, they don't believe they were most of the time. Yeah. You know, and I think there's, there's definitely a parallel to the concept of, of humans as the access point through things like fishing or, you know, fishing or whatever. Right. Uh, and there are people who are just intrinsically more likely to raise their hand. They're more susceptible to that. And as adversaries get more and more advanced, they're kind of doing, it seems like they're kind of doing the same thing we were talking about. So you, know, you want to walk through a little bit of that and just like, you know, the, some of the approaches to, uh, to, to hypnosis that, uh, that we were discussing and how that applies. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think of this similar as kind of the human AI. We had a panel yesterday on, on artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. machine learning, but you know, as uh, in the digital space, as these bad actors think about, you know, what people are sensitive to, it's kind of like Amazon, right? Or, or some of these other things that suggest what you'll buy or what you're, what you're more apt to buy, right? They start to learn your behaviors. 
I think very much like that, uh, you know, the psychology of social engineering and these bad actors, they, they understand what people's sensitivities are, what they're drawn to, et cetera. Right. So we were talking hypnosis and it's something I've been fascinated about. And what originally got me into that is watching some state, stage hypnotists and mm-hmm. kind of diving off into how real is this? But I've always been fascinated about what makes people tick and read a lot of books on leadership, a, a lot of books on just human psychology. And again, my my ultimate why at work has never been a, just purely about tech or purely about engineering or purely about oil and gas, but it's, I want people to feel fulfilled. Right. And I, I make a statement, the problem we have to solve is always gonna change, but the people we get to work on it with is what differentiates things. So I love that. just kind of thinking through that. So that's where I kind of want to dig into to are people fulfilled and happy, et cetera. So with the hypnosis thing, as I started studying it, um, one of the things they talk about is, you know, when you walk into a room, um, how does a st- stage hypnotist, for instance, know who's more susceptible to falling for something? Mm-hmm. And the example he'll give is at, a, at an event where maybe there's alcohol and you're there with uh, friends, he'll make a statement, he or she will make a statement such as, hey, show of hands, right? Who, who, who wants a drink tonight? And even if everyone in the in the room wants a drink, there's still only a portion of people that might raise their hand, right. and so they're more susceptible to actually taking a uh, uh, a direction. He he made the comment, show of hands. He or she made the comment, show of hands, and and so many people throw that hand up. Uh, the book talked about well, that's the people that they may draw up on stage because they know they're they're open to suggestion. I coupled that with a different book I read that we talked about, and it was, uh, you know, Getting to Yes. It's a mm-hmm. book that I read at, while I was getting my, my MBA, and I thought it was fascinating. It's how do you make other folks or other people on the team, how do you make it their idea? And yeah. sometimes it's inquire over advocate, but it's, you know, hey, I see this on this drawing, and what have you, have you thought about what we might do here to make this different? You know, could we use bolts instead of a weld or something like that? And it's really just triggering them to say, you know, I bet we could, let me look at that. And it's kind of making it their idea. You, yeah. you empower people. I mean, even if it may have been something you're pushing towards, you're empowering people with a little bit of creativity, but you're also changing your solutions. And I think you're also building relationships rather than being directive, you're being, again, empowering. Yeah, that, I like that. There's a, uh, I have like this switch. I'm either I'm either too observant or I have to just put blinders on, right? Because m- my uh, my observ- observation of things and the focus and, you know, understanding what motivating people and, you know, reading them is like, it, yeah, it's, it's a passion and a curse, right? Yeah. Um, so there's this perception around the organization that I I have thought everything 10 steps ahead and I'm, you know, I've, I am reading everybody's reaction to everything and and it's just the opposite it's i'm i'm focused on these things and i'm literally ignoring everything else so it when i end up engaging with different people and different types of people like carmen carmen is the exact opposite she's focused on nothing because she's engaging with everything so those those different personality it is she's she she's way more likable to me. That's actually why she's on the show, right? Um, so, in, in addition to you know to working with us, uh, but that, that getting to yes, it's people intrinsically want to help, and I think that that is the is the difference. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Everybody wants to help you though, you know. And yeah, it's giving them that opportunity to help. You're giving yeah. them space to step into it versus them having to feel like they're forcing themselves into that space. Yeah. And nobody likes to have their plan changed, but they're more than willing to change their plan. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit different. Yeah, when you just when the ordering of words. I'm um, gonna steal that comment. I like that. Yeah, yeah. None of my stuff is is worth stealing. It's not original. Feel free. <laughs> no, okay. it, it's all original except when I steal from you. But it's it's definitely not worth reusing. Um, so, the that engagement model of understanding the. You know, what motivates people, how to drive them up on stage. What kind of applications do you use that? I mean, obviously you're not hypnotizing the people that you work with, but getting the leadership. Are you? Well, he, <laughs> I, he, disclaimer, he, he confirmed he has never done that. He would never do that. He can be completely trusted. So. That's right. I, I wish that I could do stage hypnosis because I think it would be fantastic and I think it's it's fun, but no. I think just more subtly, right? I, I think some of it is just kind of turning on your EQ and understand that different people tick with different things. So I think yeah. starting with the EQ side of things and 
look, it's not always easy. I'll, I'll say, you know, Jeff, I probably would have misread you a little bit wrong and thinking you're 10 steps ahead. Yeah. Uh, I can see you're absolutely observant, but yeah. right, I, even I have kind of attribution error based on yeah. what I'm observing. Yeah. I think you have to engage your teams mm -hmm. and find out what makes them tick. And then and then try to you know everyone's going to be a little bit different and then find out like what what uh what motivates them i do think you know to carmen's point i think everybody wants to contribute mm -hmm. and leave the end of the day feeling like they made a difference i had an employee at the conference say that yesterday that that works for homework and pain said you know at the end of the day whether it takes three years or the thing takes a week i just want to leave the end of the day thinking that i'm i, I made I, you know, that I made some contribution in my work day. Yeah. And I think figuring out how to allow them and empower them to 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 feel like they could make a, a small decision or do something to help someone. But again, not not just not not having the boundaries so tight that they can't feel that freedom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I spend a lot of time um, trying to provide the necessary context and perspective so people will make decisions. Right. Um, even if it's not the same one I would make. Yeah. But I think there there's some attribution error like that, you know, of uh, how I operate. And sometimes I'm a few steps ahead on things that are, I'm focused on. And and it, I personally have to fight being like just because I'm a few steps ahead on this doesn't mean that I want to make this decision or that I should make this decision. I just need you to have the context. Right. Because everything we do is can, is captured as risk. So do you understand the criticality a variable that you're dealing with do you understand the vulnerability element of this and do you understand what the threat because the difference between three years and one week is highly dependent on the bad guy right yeah if you if they're going to be here in eight days you've got seven to get this done right yeah. um but there there's so much of that consideration of risk that's not normalized in the way it people operate you know they're thinking i got to take care of my team they're thinking I got to get these tasks done. And most of the time, the can the context and the perspective is is the job, right? Yeah, if you tell your team you the impact that you doing these things will have and in the context of risk, it changes it from go do this to I want to do this, I want to do it faster, I want to get you know, so the, the for me, everything every decision must come back to those those basic frameworks of what's the mission? Are we doing this in a risk focused approach? Are we applying a system that allows us to scale to all the places that we need it? And it's uh, my I feel like my job is mostly is is like a uh, coach and an educator rather than a business decision maker. Yeah. Um, but it, but the perception of what I'm doing is something I know I have to fight. Yeah. And, you know, Carmen could probably test to that. It's it's easy to be like just tell me the an the answer. You know? like, yeah, that's not why I'm here. I, I think it's an interesting point you're making, and I really hadn't thought a lot about that. But in the cyberspace specifically, whether it's on my team working for an enterprise or or you all that, that you know try to come in and help everybody, mm -hmm. right? How the uh, context is, is everything, but you right. guys are also forced into again, there's a timeliness component, right? So yeah. you've got to be quick to, to clarify and provide that context. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's there's certain times where it's, yeah, I, and this is something I struggle with, I think as a leader, especially early on, there might be three ways to do thing. And, and I have a, a tendency or affinity to kind of want to go back and do it the way I would have done it. Or maybe I, I think it was going to be, you know, a third the time. Right. But again, at the end of the day, I need to, to, to allow other people to, to be successful and again, to have those accomplishments. But in the world of cyber, right, we, the, the context and, and associating that with the risk is everything. Mm -hmm. So as you say, people want to uh, to rise to that occasion well yeah. it's also always changing too because you know we talk about adaptive risk management and it's always changing right you have to be able to keep up and i think that's where we rely on you so much because it is changing so that you know that next layer down trying to make those business decisions without all the context that you have i mean it's hard to keep up and know to move a group of you know 12 people in the same direction at the same time at every every moment that it changes yeah, this uh, Dan, one of our SVPs, um, he's an incredible guy. He's very, he's a yeah, great leader. You know, his teams love him. You know, our partners in the ecosystem love him because he he he's whip smart, but he legitimately cares. Um, you could see it in him. He yeah, he, uh, yeah. I was noticing last night. He kind of has this this constant smile on his face, yeah. just this this grin. Yeah, he's so having fun. Um, and you know, Dan's 
never never really worked with with somebody like me before so he you know we, we were sat down we were having a drink you know of water you know you got to stay hydrated um and you know he, he said that i i reminded him of uh the ben stiller character you know when he was he was an actuary and everything he was like on the that, then in the spectrum of like he was always calculating risk yeah and and my response was like i i do operate that way that's the way my brain thinks but i have a much higher risk tolerance than the vast majority of people you know i jumped out of an airplane with a parachute i knew was wasn't packed correctly because i had a reserve that i knew was right and thankfully i didn't have to use it but i i nearly did right <laughs> so there you know there's um there's an aspect to running a business like ours like that you can't just be uh the risk person who thinks about we have to stop everything um and that's why we really you know our approach has been to focus on resiliency because we have to meet everybody where they're at like there's limit limitations on the amount of investment they can make the number of people they can throw at the problem the the other priorities that are that exist within the organization and you know my 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 guidance to the team is let's do as much as we can do within the the environment that there is, you know, considering the constraints and realize that bad guys can always get in if they're focused on you 24 seven. So first, don't be the slowest gazelle and then we can get to, you know, a much higher level of resiliency. Uh, so that's it is very much a, a risk calculation within the context of the business, you know, because no margin, no mission. Right? Yeah. And and ultimately, cyber is something that uh, first attacks margin before it protects it yeah absolutely so we got any more questions for jay i don't think we asked a single question that i actually sent you but yeah so i think we're good well thank That's you for great thank you for joining us yeah um and and for the friendship and at some point i look forward to you know getting on the mats with you absolutely uh, letting you beat me up I don't know about that, but no, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I, I, I also received just fantastic feedback on uh, Wednesday when you guys taught the training sessions. The team said they were fantastic. So yeah. I just appreciate that everyone's in the mission together and that, yeah. uh, you know, we'll continue making strides. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers.